Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Armando Contreras, President and CEO of United Cerebral Palsy, which helps thousands of individuals and families living with cerebral palsy and other disabilities. Nancy Miller, Executive Director and CEO of Visions Services in New York, which helps people of all ages who are blind or visually impaired. And Brian Nider, CEO of Gay Path in the San Francisco Bay Area, which supports those living with disabilities. Thank you for joining us panel. And uh, for those on the webinar, um, we will uh, try to answer any questions that you leave during the chat in the course of the broadcast. And uh, thank you so much for attending. So let's, let's start a little bit about how we serve uh, our constituents during this crazy COVID-19 time. It doesn't stop, does it, Armando? Um, it does not, actually. Um, it gets a little bit more intense um, times, and it gets quite challenging. United Cerebral Palsy has been around for over 70 years. And at the national office where I work and in Washington, D.C., um, we try to provide the resources that are needed for our affiliates that provide direct services to people with cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, autism, developmental delays. So these past two months have been um, one of really focusing on providing information that's tangible, information that they can really use, information related to the three economic stimulation, um, stimulus um, packages that have been out there, clarifications, trying to bring consultants that can actually help them maneuver through this really difficult time. Just one quick example is that some of our affiliates have actually closed programs, and that's unfortunate because there's, there's a population in these programs, children and adults, that they bring over to their um, UCP facility um, they provide training, they provide sc schooling, uh, therapy, so forth and so on. And that had a, a halt, um, which also um, incurs the issues of funding. Um, so a lot of challenges happening. United Cerebral Policy National is here to provide any information that they need so they can get through this really difficult time. And, and we're all trying to not only help vulnerable populations and those living with cerebral palsy have uh, the types of conditions that um, can make them more vulnerable to, uh, to conditions like COVID-19, but you're also trying in this sort of close service uh, function to protect the service providers. Nancy, you have a, a similar issue, although in your particular case, all services do not necessarily have to, or the preponderance of services don't necessarily have to involve physical presence, but it's very difficult to find, to help somebody who is visually impaired uh, from a distance because so much of our technologies are reliant on screens, on, on visual cues. Uh, talk a little bit about how you're coping in the COVID-19 era. So thank you. Uh, Visions is a 94-year-old organization with 106 staff. About one-third of our staff are blind themselves. And we are able to teach the participants that we serve a variety of alternate techniques for using technology. Uh, the problem that we see every day, but with COVID-19, because we're serving a low-income uh, mostly persons of color, mostly older adults. Uh, they don't have the technology at home that is available, but they can't afford it. So we're actually providing services for over 300 blind older adults, basically using the telephone. Everything from yoga classes to exercise, to making sure that they're connected with home delivered meals uh, because they don't have the talking computer or the right. software that they need. Um, we also, we see so many of our staff who are blind older persons themselves or at risk for other reasons. But we've been able to convert within about a week 
from providing almost all of our services in person to about 75% of our services remotely and touch with the hundreds of blind and visually impaired persons that we serve. In terms of, of this type of uh, service, you end up with a more extreme issue um, in terms of technology um, as we can no longer uh, work in person. And, and uh, Brian, your constituents have uh, other issues in terms of developmental disabilities. Talk about how you're serving now at a time when uh, physical distance is so important to, uh, to halting the progression of the virus into society. Sure, thank you, Mark. And uh, happy to be on the panel with two other uh, longstanding organizations. We actually celebrate our 100th anniversary here in June. And who, know, who knew we'd be in the middle of a shelter in place pandemic for our 100th anniversary? Uh, yeah. So shortly after, actually before the shelter in place, we were already seeing sort of the trend of where things were going here in San Mateo and Santa Clara County, where we're at in the San Francisco Bay Area. We started to plan for uh, what it might look like if we did have to go into a shelter in place. Our programs, we run uh, early screening and family resource center in San Mateo County. And then we have three inclusive preschools. Uh, we have about 40 therapists providing OT, PT, and speech. And then we have adult programs, everything from employment, site-based, community-based programs. And so the approach we had to take was unique for kind of each one of those four areas. Um, I'm happy to say within about a week, we had flipped everything to a virtual delivery. We've been pushing technology for the better part of two and a half years. And so we have 13 locations. And so video conferencing was not unusual for our team to use that because commutes can be pretty bad. And so we'd gotten used to having so many meetings in a virtual format. It meant that that leap to doing it was not huge. Though I will say, you know, providing therapy or outreach to adults that we serve has some complexity. Some learning for us uh, is just how significant the digital divide is. So we've had to write grants trying to get, and we're actually purchasing iPads, smartphones, to be able to give to other therapy clients or to provide access for adults that we serve. So the therapy, we flipped almost 60% of our therapy practice to a virtual delivery in one week, which is amazing. We have 40 therapists, like I said, that's a lot of folks and families to get on board with virtual therapy for their children. Our preschools, inclusive preschools are doing two virtual sessions every day. And we've added a parent support group because parents are obviously under a lot of stress as well. Similarly for adult programs, a lot of adults that we serve have either had to go back and stay with their caregivers, family members, or go to the group homes. And this has created unique challenges. So we actually have a parent support group for elderly uh, adults that we serve that are living at or younger, living at home with their parents, that their children may have been uh, at work or in a day program or a community program. And that caregiving is now 100% on their lap. Uh, so we've been doing outreach, we've put virtual, uh, we've created a YouTube channel with all sorts of programs. We have a daily drop or a weekly drop in with our staff visiting every one of our clients with a activity package for them to have for the coming week that they can follow along either by a smart device, a computer if they have one, or if they don't, that the, the package itself includes activities they can do during the week. So uh, oh, well. it's been, sorry, yeah. It's just been quite a transformation. And where we are right now, Mark, is we're anticipating what does a new normal look like? Because it is a very complex plan to put back into place. When you have social distancing and safety of staff and participants, how do you manage that in what the new normal is, is going to look like? We're hoping to have draft plans like that we can share by next week. How are you all um, functioning in terms of uh, issues like PPE, right? We can't even get our medical providers with sufficient uh, uh, protective gear. Testing is, is really difficult and there are huge delays. So that by the time you get a response on tests, uh, you can't wait to serve. You can't wait, Armando, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, serve somebody who needs physical support, physical support, touching. Um, how, how do you actually ensure that P 
people are safe, both your clients are safe from pr prospective infection by a service provider or a family member on the one hand, and that your service providers are also safe in their interactions from clients. Are you finding, are, are you getting gear? Are you, are you able to, um, to uh, equip your people appropriately and your clients? Yeah, Mark. So the um, the challenges that we have across the nation is that some are getting gear and some are waiting to get gear. Some are waiting to open. Um, I'll give you one example of the United Cerebral Palsy of San Luis Obispo. Um, just what Brian was mentioning is like the new normal. They're, they're open right now, but now they have a new set of rules. New set of rules of how when they come into the office, um, uh, a set of rules of distancing, a set of rules of having a mask, having gloves, um, even a rule when they go to, to the bathroom, a rule when they, when they begin to interact with the people that they're serving. So those service providers are now going into this new normal that I believe, and I'm, I'm sure Nancy and Brian would probably be on the same page, is that it's not going to end tomorrow. I think this is, a, this is just going to be a new way of of engaging and still trying to provide the best quality services that we can so we can continue to change lives. So um, do we have it all at this point, all the answers? I, we don't, we don't have that. But what's, what's happening is like in the states, you have certain states that, that perhaps are, are doing better than others related to the infection and related to deaths. Um, well, because we have UCPs in the United States, each one is different, and that also causes the complexities that we have of those that are prepared, those that are getting prepared, and those that are trying to figure things out. But what we're doing right now amongst the national network is sharing the, the, good pra the best practices with each one. And that's one thing that we do from our national office. So then they can take a look at what is San Luis Obispo doing compared to Mobile, Alabama. So it's is, our job really to make those connections. The in New York internet and, and access, uh, excuse, uh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Is, I, I just wanted to ask you, and particularly you and you, Nancy, do you feel that the internet access to high, uh, high speed, you know, good bandwidth and the ability to interact through technology, do you think that that's becoming now a utility like electricity, or like the telephone that you referred to, Nancy, do we really need to shift in this, in this country and really address that digital divide? Because it seems that for all of these, these support services and then extending beyond into education and, and other areas that nonprofits serve, if we can't get this right, we are cutting out and generationally cutting out huge swaths of the population huge swaths, the disabled community, people without money, uh, people who, um, who live with different uh, types of, of issues. Nancy, what do, you, what do you think? We absolutely see the digital divide. Um, number one, income is huge. Uh, our low income population, and that's the primary population vision serves, does not have the equipment that they need to function from home. It just doesn't exist and there is no funding source. Uh, the federal government funds the equipment for you at work, but it does not fund the equipment for you at home through the Rehab Services Administration. Uh, it's a particular problem for older persons who are blind and have other chronic conditions um, because they may not be as comfortable with the technology. So it's not just buying it for them, it's making sure they know how to use it. Uh, the inspiration we get actually is from our younger job seekers who actually are quite adept at using the technology uh, both because they've learned it early in school or because we've been able to teach it to them in our uh, technology training classes. Uh, so age is a factor, income is a factor. Um, whether or not the person has been living in the United States for a long period of time or is a new immigrant is another major issue uh, that we see in New York City. 
Um, when it comes to uh, protective equipment, we actually have one staff person who just spends the entire day ordering from a dozen different places to prepare us for our reopening when we know we are going to need masks and sanitizers. In New York State and actually throughout the country, there are manufacturers who are nonprofit blindness agencies that run manufacturing programs. And they in fact have sanitizers available. They have face masks available. So we're trying to purchase from our nonprofit colleagues um, in order to both keep their employees working, their blind employees working, and also prepare us for the reopening. But the biggest problem for us right now is really the stress and the anxiety and the dealing with so much death on the part of our staff and also on the part of our participants with so many people losing spouses and family members and not being able to have typical bereavement. So it's managing an organization at the same time that people are feeling terrible, terrible losses. One of the big issues that we're all facing is this combination of having to shift so much in terms of our operations while dealing with the trauma that we have. And the question is whether the society is coming together in a cohesive way to preserve America as a meritocracy, right? So we have here a whole range of people who are living, living, functioning every day with various impediments. And together as a society, can we, can we come together and make the change while also helping through the trauma? How are, you, how are you in terms of your interactions with people outside of your own networks? For example, Brian, uh, uh, Brian comes from entertainment arts, he comes from a technology field, and he's right in the center of the technology hub of the world. Um, are you finding, Brian, that people are uh, in the commercial sector trying to help nonprofits using these kind of distance uh, tools to deal with both the, tr the, the trauma element? How do you grieve online? Because we can't grieve in person. On the other hand, how do you serve by bridging these digital divides so that not only the wealthy are confirmed in, in their wealth, but we also allow people to come up like, like we ourselves have and our families have over time. It's uh, a great you, question, Mark. Uh, yeah, we've been, I, I think, uh, we've been blessed by having a very supportive community across the board, not only from tech companies here in the Bay Area. Uh, we have a lot of our uh, adult program participants in employment at many of the corporate campuses up and down the, the uh, Silicon Valley, uh, those offices that have closed have continued to pay all of our participants, even though they're contractors, as if they were their own staff, which has been remarkable. We have a big gala coming up on May 14th that is going virtual, I'm happy to share more about that. But all of our corporate sponsors have signed up. All of them are pushing their employees to dial in to our virtual event. We have not had one sponsor withdraw their funding for this event when we announced that it was going virtual and was not going to be live. And then participate and give a talk as part of our event. Uh, we have a group of volunteers. In fact, uh, the folks at Intuit, if anybody's doing their taxes, uh, know of Intuit and QuickBooks, uh, they're looking to volunteer to do something. So we have a card and letter writing and outreach program to make sure all of our uh, uh, adult folks that are either in a group home or back at home or in independent living have outreach from their community, letting them know they're an important part of our community. So things have come together. I think, you know, we're all kind of figuring it out as we go. But I would say if you want to call it sort of, uh, since we didn't have March Madness this year, the, well, we do have March Madness, a different kind, but it's kind of the possession <laughs> arrow, if you will, at the sports analogy, is people are leaning into reaching out, which is great. And, and uh, we've been surprised uh, about the, the outpouring of support collectively for nonprofits, not just ours. And so I think part of our job in, in nonprofit leadership is to make sure we have 
an appropriate ask for support when we need it. There may be a gap in what we need. I, I think Nancy mentioned just reaching out to others for some PPE and things like that. Uh, those kind of things, you know, we need to call on our friends for those gaps that may not be naturally filled through volunteers or traditional corporate sponsorship and support. Well, one of the one of our webcast audience members uh, asked exactly what you were covering, Brian. They were asking about how do we do fundraising um, in, in this area and this whole idea of reaching out and trying to figure out how to do virtual fundraising events, um, which which are a challenge. We haven't really done those before. We most of our right. fundraising events have been in person, but we can't necessarily do that. The whole idea of cards, Armando, are, are you uh, developing? Uh, different approaches to fundraising. Nancy, are you are you both uh, doing the kinds of things that Brian is trying to invent as well? Yeah, Mark. So one thing that we did immediately, maybe not fundraising, but we really focused on what the uh, payroll uh, payment protection program was about. We had a question, was it only for small businesses? Was it only for for-profits? And in this uh, research, we found out that hey, nonprofits can actually apply for that. So an immediate move that we did is we pro provided our national network um, with the information that they can apply, that they can go ahead and apply. Um, we had a great group called the Jatatsa Group that provided free consultation. Um, if they had any questions related to the SBA application, they would be there of help. Um, so many of them applied and many of them, I'm not sure if all of them, but they've already been funded anywhere from a hundred thousand to over a million dollars. Why is that so important for the nonprofits in the United States is because there's a forgivable component to it. And uh, we're still trying to understand that. We think it's close to hundred uh, percent, but we still got to get some more information. Um, so that's one. The, the other, the other thing is that we're doing at national is that, when we fundraise, we don't fundraise only for the national office. Right. We put our affiliates first. And that's something that changed when I came on board three years ago is that we send information out. We tell the story of what's happening um, in, the, in the United States related to children that are at home and that their, um, their whole routine has changed. The whole routine has changed totally and the disabilities community is not an easy thing. Um, Dr. Uh, Michael Kruer also mentioned that, that people with disabilities also have a, a higher risk. The CDC said the same thing. So we want to make sure that we let the public know maybe more accurate information about this time is what we're doing in our fundraising efforts, which is, which is the digital part that we do on, um, on the emails. And also we still do the old fashioned type of, um, of um, direct mail which we believe that there was a lot of people home that would be receiving our direct mail. So um, that's kind of in just in general. And Nancy, we've, how do you? We've reached out specifically to our board uh, at Visions who have been extremely generous in giving more and giving more frequently and maybe earlier in the year than they normally would. Um, but also the foundations in New York City have been extraordinarily responsive. So those that have given money to Visions for a specific project have now allowed us to make it a general operating grant. Uh, there are also a number of foundations that have come together just for COVID-19 related expenses that are not being covered by government contracts. Um, and we also have been doing a number of virtual events, not so much to raise money, but we need something that will give us some pleasure, make us laugh, bring our community together. So we've actually had some of our gala honorees do free performances for us. And if people want to donate, they can, but it's more that we can communicate with each other, see each other, um, be involved with each other and do something that helps lighten the load for everyone. And getting all of those honorees to volunteer for us and not get paid, 
uh, even if it's non-professional, it's made a huge difference. And in fact, we've also raised money because people do understand for people who are blind and multi-disabled, this is a particularly difficult disease because you need to stay away. And yet blind people are very dependent on touch and uh, being close and uh, it's very difficult for them to keep that six feet apart. So we've, we've had another um, series of questions from our webinar guests. I think we've covered most of them from the Pomeroy Center. David Davinsky was asking about how we prepare for the future. And I think we've, we've tried to cover that uh, in this. Let's close on, on, a, on a note of, of optimism and hope, because one of the things that we cannot lose here is the fact that we run, we run, on hope, we run on optimism. We get so much energy from the people who serve and the people who in, in being served also serve their fellows. Talk a little bit about what you're experiencing in terms of the energy that people are contributing to your various causes. Let's start with you, Brian, sure. and then we'll go to Nancy, and then we'll, we'll wind up with Armando. You know, the... Uh... I can't tell you how impressed I've been with our team. The resilience of the team, the innovation, creativity, and the response from the families and adults and children we serve has been, um, people understand what it's like and they know that our staff are also juggling two worlds, the world of serving the community that we do serve. And also many of them have family at home that they're caring for. And to, to see people really step up in a crisis and go above and beyond I think that is emboldening others to do the same in their other areas with their neighbors or whatever it might be. And it is, you know, it's, uh, it's great to see that kind of response from, from the community at large, but you know, it started with our team and I just uh, couldn't be prouder of the work that they've done. Nancy? Yeah, we, we've had so many successes in this period of time. Uh, we have blind job seekers who've actually gotten hired in those businesses that are desperate for employees and at risk to their own health, want to be out there and contributing to the community. We have a staff member who is making face masks for the entire staff. Um, in the evening hours when she's by herself, she's just sewing masks and sending them out to all the staff. We have another staff person who is a assistive technology instructor, and he's actually going house to house to every one of our staff and every one of our participants who need hands-on help with the technology that we've sent them. We've paid for it, but they don't necessarily know how to use it. And he's covering all of New York City, Long Island, Westchester, and Rockland, which is hundreds of miles. And I also see the staff being incredibly supportive of one another. Um, I mentioned two of our staff lost their husbands and the outpouring from their colleagues has been incredible. And, and we've been kind. And I think that's what has been most important as an employer, as a colleague, as a friend, that it's brought out the best in us. And what we do so well as nonprofits, which is serving those most in need, we are seeing that at every level of our organization. Sorry to hear about your staff losses, Nancy. That's very sad. Yes. yes. Armando? Yeah, Nancy and Brian, also my, my condolences really to those that um, have lost their lives and those that are suffering in the hospital. Well, I have to say that United Cerebral Palsy National serves 155,000 children and adults in the United States. We also have two affiliates in Canada. So the affiliate leadership really has stepped up during this time that wasn't expected, right? It was like almost from one day to another, things started to change. But really the shout out for me is for those direct support professionals. The ones that are actually in homes, the ones that um, are really first responders. We do hear first responders and, and, I, and we think about doctors, which of course we need to think about them and nurses and, and police and firemen, but first responders also include direct service support 
professionals. They're in, in there in day in, day out, trying to figure out not just only to provide the services that they usually do. Now it's an additional burden because folks are struggling either psychologically, um, they're struggling with what you, you had mentioned in the past, like uh, Nancy um, touching you know, that's a big part of the disability community. That's not happening now. So they're gonna, they're adapting to this new way of providing service. And, and even today, we still don't have that best practices, but I believe that through this event and through this experience and, and through the organizations that Nancy, Brian, and many others run, that we'll come up with some best practices in the, in the disability community to share with, with each and, and, and every one of the organizations that we have. So um, again, my, my sincere appreciation to those that are drivers, those that are out um, helping as far as direct um, uh, connect with the, with the people that we serve. And of course, the affiliate leadership that is finding ways to keep their doors open in, in many ways. So um, my, 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 my gratitude to all of them. Thank you, Armando Contreras of uh, United Cerebral Palsy, Nancy Miller of Vision Services in New York, and Brian Nider of uh, GatePath. Please extend to your staff, your boards, and your constituents our love, support, and admiration. You are keeping America strong. You are the heroes on the front lines. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us, and let's continue. Let's continue our work. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark. Appreciate thank you, Nancy Appreciate Armando. You. And thank, thank you all for attending the webinar. We'll be here again next week to share some more stories and to also incite change in America for the better for us all. Have a great day.